Hi everyone, this lesson is a continuation on the tapeworm infection series. So we're going to talk about the beef tapeworm in this lesson. So we will talk about how individuals get infected with this particular tapeworm. We will also talk about the signs and symptoms of infection, how this infection is diagnosed, and how it's treated. So there are many different species of tapeworm that can infect humans. And one species in particular can infect humans from beef products, and that species is known as Tania saginata, or T. saginata. That is the beef tapeworm. Like other tapeworms, it is flat in appearance, so it can actually look like a piece of tape. And like other tapeworm species, it is a gastrointestinal parasite, so it resides in the patient's small intestine and acts as a parasite. It absorbs nutrients from the patient. And with regards to Tania saginata, humans are the definitive host. Having an infection with this particular type of tapeworm causes the condition of taniasis. We will talk about taniasis as we go through this lesson in the signs and symptoms and ways to diagnose and treat it. Now, how many people are actually affected by this particular tapeworm is unknown. The true prevalence is unknown because it's likely underdiagnosed in many countries. It is believed to be more rare in the United States, for instance, though, as it may be decreasing due to improved sanitation. So it's believed that the estimated prevalence in the USA is less than 1% of the general population, although this is likely an underestimate. It's probably the case that, yes, the infection by this particular tapeworm species is on the decline, but the diagnosis of these particular tapeworms is probably on the decline as well. So it's unknown as to the true prevalence. It is known that this particular tapeworm is probably more common in other continents of the world, including Europe, South America, Asia, and Africa, than it is in North America, for instance. So not much is known as to the true prevalence, but it's likely on the decline due to improved sanitation. But again, it's likely also underdiagnosed as well. Now let's talk about how this particular tapeworm infects humans. So because this is the beef tapeworm, it's going to come from cattle or cows. So how do those cows become infected by this particular tapeworm themselves? So what happens is there's going to be eggs or proglottids. Proglottids are these little packets of eggs in the environment. So they can be in vegetation. And with regards to Tania saginata, cattle or cows will come along and become infected by these eggs through ingestion of contaminated vegetation. What will then happen is that the eggs will become known as oncospheres. They will hatch and then penetrate intestinal walls inside the cow and circulate throughout the cow's body and enter into the musculature, so into the cow muscle. Once the oncospheres get to muscle, they will develop into cystis cerci. So these are the infective stage of this particular type of tapeworm. What will then happen is that a human will then consume raw or undercooked beef or raw or undercooked cow muscle that contains the cystis cerci. The cystis cerci will then develop inside the human into an adult tapeworm and will use what is known as a scolex. The scolex is the head of the tapeworm to attach to the gastrointestinal mucosa, which is the inner lining of the small intestine. So here is what a scolex of the tapeworm looks like. Those tapeworms then absorb nutrients through their flat segmented bodies. So they have, again have a flat shape. They look like a piece of tape and they have segmented bodies, and those segments are called proglottids. They absorb nutrients because they don't have gastrointestinal systems themselves. Those segmented pieces of the tapeworm body, or what is known as proglottids, mature, and they contain eggs. And what will happen is that those proglottids will then break off and are excreted in the patient's stool, enter into the environment, and then the cycle will continue. So this is how this particular cycle of Tania saginata occurs. So here is what a proglottid might look like. So it's essentially just a little piece of the chain of a tapeworm. So again, it comes from uncooked or undercooked beef that contains these cysticercoids. Again, these are the infective stage of this particular tapeworm species. A human will come along and eat that uncooked or undercooked beef containing those cysticercoids. This is the gastrointestinal mucosa inside the patient's small intestine. Those cysticercoids will then develop into an adult tapeworm in roughly 10 to 12 weeks in Tania saginata. So it can take months for the cysticercoid to develop into an adult tapeworm. That adult tapeworm will then attach using its scolex onto the gastrointestinal mucosa, and it can grow quite long. It can grow from four meters up to 12 meters in length, so very long, and it has a very long lifespan of 25 years. So it can last for a long time as well. So a patient can have this particular tapeworm for a long time. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of taniasis or an infection with this particular tapeworm. 
So it's important to note that most patients who are infected with this particular tapeworm are asymptomatic, meaning they have no symptoms at all. If they are symptomatic, they may have some vague gastrointestinal symptoms, which we will talk about as we go through the signs and symptoms. One sign that may be noted in a patient who has a tapeworm infection in general is the passage of proglottids or larger tapeworm segments in the stool. So again, these proglottids are little pieces of the long chain of the tapeworm and they break off as I mentioned before. They can be noted as little white pieces in the patient's stool. The passage of these proglottids can lead to anal irritation and pruritus, so anal itching. So this is a cause of pruritus ani. And patients with this particular type of tapeworm infection can also have abdominal pain. And what's interesting about this abdominal pain is that it has a colicky characteristic in children. So it can come and go in a wave-like manner. And it's worse in the morning and relieved with small amounts of eating. So in patients in general, it doesn't have to be children, but in patients in general, this abdominal pain that a patient might experience from this particular tapeworm infection is worse in the morning and relieved with eating small amounts of food. So that's very interesting to note. Another important symptom of this particular tapeworm infection is nausea. And again, what's important and interesting about this particular feature is that, again, nausea is worse in the morning and relieved with small amounts of eating. So seeing abdominal pain and nausea that are worse in the morning and relieved with small amounts of eating may be a sign of an infection with this particular tapeworm. And vomiting may occur in children. This is unlikely to occur in adult patients. Patients can also experience increase or decrease of appetite, and they can also experience constipation and or diarrhea. Some patients can also experience some more rare findings, including a headache, dizziness, weakness, and hyperexcitability and irritability. This is going to be more common in children. So children are going to be, in general, more likely to experience signs and symptoms of a tapeworm infection than adult patients. And they may also have a fever. They may mount a fever to the tapeworm infection as well. There are particular complications of tenaiasis or an infection with tania tapeworm species. One of them is going to be appendicitis. So appendicitis is actually going to be the most common and serious complication of an infection with tania saginata. So you can imagine that the tapeworm, if it's long and large, it may actually cause an obstruction of the appendix leading to inflammation and enlargement of the appendix. Another rare complication of infection with this tapeworm is bile duct obstruction. So again, the tapeworm gets in the way of some of the ducts inside the gastrointestinal system causing obstruction. And this may lead to cholecystitis or an inflammation of the gallbladder. Pancreatic duct obstruction may also occur as well, and this may lead to pancreatitis. And then overall gastrointestinal obstruction. So you can imagine that if there are multiple tapeworms in the gastrointestinal tract, they could lead to an obstruction or a partial obstruction, which would cause signs and symptoms of a gastrointestinal obstruction like nausea, vomiting, constipation, and possibly abdominal distension. So those are all possible complications of a tania saginata infection. How do clinicians diagnose this particular tapeworm? So like other tapeworm infections, it's going to be through stool ova and parasites, looking at the patient's stool for ova, which are eggs, and the tapeworms themselves, so the parasites. It's going to require multiple stool samples. Like other tapeworm infections, it's important to have multiple stool samples usually at least two to three stool samples on different days. That is often required for the diagnosis of a tapeworm infection. And it may also be important to test other members of the family as well. So this is going to be the mainstay of diagnosing this tapeworm infection like other tapeworm infections. But there are some other lab tests that could be performed, including copro PCR, copro AG ELISA, or serology testing. And then if there is blood work done for another reason, like a CBC, a complete blood count, Mild eosinophilia may be found. So eosinophilia is an elevation in eosinophil count. So eosinophils are the white blood cells that attack parasites. So this is the reason why we may see a mild elevation in eosinophil count. Once it has been diagnosed, how is it treated? So clinicians will use anti-helminth therapies. So medications like praziquantel and niclosamide are going to be important for treatment. And what are some ways to actually prevent this particular type of infection from occurring in the first place? So good hand hygiene, if touching raw beef products, it's important to wash hands afterwards. Improved meat inspection is going to be important. Ensuring that meat products are cooked to at least 
165 degrees Fahrenheit or at least 74 degrees Celsius is going to be important. So this can help kill or neutralize those cystocircoid within the meat. And then freezing meat to minus 31 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 35 degrees Celsius or lower for at least seven to 10 days may also neutralize the cystocircoid within the meat as well. So this is also another way that could help neutralize or reduce the risk for a Tani saginata infection. So if you want to learn more about other tapeworm infections, please check out my infectious disease playlist. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.